everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Parents Who Write. Today, I have Rebecca Evans on the show. She is a memoirist, a poet, and an essayist. She also teaches creative nonfiction at Boys State University, mentors high school girls in the juvenile system, and co-hosts the radio program Writer to Writer. Rebecca is also disabled, a veteran, a Jew, and a mother to three sons, ages 21, 19, and 13. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. You know what? Thank you, Erin, for having me. I'm just honored to be here. Really appreciate your time. Um, thank you. So we have a lot of really interesting things to talk about today because your writing resume just blows my mind. I promise I'm just one person, though. <laughs> <laughs> one person who has done quite a lot. <laughs> Speaking of which, you have quite the extensive background between serving in the military, training pro athletes, recovering from a neck injury, losing use of your hands for a few years, just to list a few. How have these experiences shaped the purpose of your writing? Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm a memoirist, and even even my poetry, even any work that I start to shape or form or orchestrate or choreograph on the page always comes from my experiences. And mm. so, you know, when someone asks, how long did it take you to write this or write that? I usually say 56 years. You know, I've had to live wow. my whole life and then process some of those things, own some of those things, look back in reflection and gain wisdom with some of those things. So all of it informs me, has taught me something, has shaped me. Some things have destroyed me and broken me and mm -hmm. I've reshaped myself. So I could say that about every experience, you know, there's positive and negative, but they're all experiences that shape my writing, inform my writing, inform the way I see the world, the way I navigate through the world, and my intention behind things that I do. I think I'm a, an extremely intentional person. So yeah, all of those things contribute. I love your perspective on things so much. So maybe you touched upon this a bit, but I want to dive a little deeper. Why do you love writing? Why is this something that you have to do? What is it that pulls you to write? Well, first and foremost, I write just to sort myself out. Mm -hmm. I journal every single morning. I write a poem a day. Some of all that stuff is not anything I'd ever share or worth <laughs> sharing. But really, the goal is just to figure something out. And a lot of times, I don't know what I'm trying to figure out. I mm -hmm. follow the words down the page, and I love it when I'm surprised and something comes up that I didn't expect and surfaces for me. And I gained some insight about myself with doing that. Some of those things end up being worthy of sharing. Maybe someone else can gain insight or hope or healing from my own experience. So I have a question for you now. Okay. You're journaling. I always talk about how journaling is the gateway to creativity. I firmly believe that. And so I'm curious, do you have a set journaling method? You know, some people get overwhelmed with journaling because they feel like it's Dear Diary and you have to write 30 pages, but it's it's not just that. So that's why I was just curious your view on that or if you had a method behind it, or I would imagine you just kind of free flow it, but I'm still just curious. <laughs> I am probably the most systematic person you will meet. Like I'm hyper analytical and I'm hyper logistical, but I also know you cannot completely shape everything or you mm -hmm. lose the creativity part of things. I would consider how I approach my writing or journaling as kind of like watercolor. Like, you mm -hmm. know, you have to prep the paper for watercolor. You have to spread water on it. You have to tape it down. You have to have it prepared to accept the watercolor. And then you start painting and the watercolor is going to do what the watercolor does, right? And you have to like let go. So I think if you're a super organized person and you want to be creative, watercolor is one of the greatest things you can do on the side to try to <laughs> teach you like the art of letting go. So for me, I have a morning routine and I have an evening routine. So I do what I call my bookends and I teach about this. I teach about different journaling techniques. But I do my bookends. As parents, we do this for our children. We know they need a bedtime routine. 
We know mm-hmm. they need structure. And then we grow up and we forget to use that structure for ourselves. But there's mm-hmm. art in the containment, right? Mm-hmm. And so in the morning, I allow it to be somewhat adaptable. But the first hour of the day does involve reading poetry, writing poetry, and journaling. And I meditate and I pray and I just get centered so I can launch into my day. And the evening is very similar to that, but it's more of unloading and unpacking from my day. And, and that just contains me and sets me up. I write everything in my journal, except for lists. If I have to do things, I have separate paper aside that I'll put tasks down so I can empty those out as they come up, but Mm -hmm. I'll go back and I tab my journals. I have little tabs on the side. This is a poem. This is an essay. Flush this out. Um, Explore this more. Go deeper here. I've been doing this 35 years. So I'll go back through and download my journal onto my computer with things I think might be worthy of turning into something. So everything I write starts off longhand. I just Mm -hmm. feel like my heart is more connected to the work that way. Nice. Yeah. I appreciate that because, well, it's a proven fact that when we write with pen and ink on paper, we are engaging a different part of our brain. Mm-hmm. So I I love being able to go back and forth between my computer versus longhand as well. Years ago, I, I took Chinese calligraphy, ancient Chinese calligraphy lessons. And mm-hmm. the artist was teaching me like, it comes from the shoulder and the whole body mm-hmm. is involved in calligraphy, right? It's not just this wrist movement. And that was really interesting to me how your whole body gets involved. You know, if you're watercoloring, if you're painting, if you're sketching, why Mm -hmm. not with writing? And there really is a visceral thing that happens, I feel, with me, Yeah. you know, when I write longhand. So when my hands weren't working, Uh that was super difficult for me as far as just trying to connect with myself, you know? Yeah. I can only imagine how challenging that must have been. How did you get through that? Well, I I had my sons and mm-hmm. my youngest was, I think, four or five at the time. And I kept rubber banding colored pencils to my hand and trying to move with my shoulder to color. Oh. And he was teaching me to use my hands again to color. So I was using that movement that I was taught and I was trying to use them through my body instead. And then I used a voiceover program for the computer. I was still in school. Yeah. So that was fun. <laughs> but what also like an interesting way to bond with your four-year-old, you oh know, like talk about memories. He's like, you're doing great mom. And I'm like, all oh. oh, over the place. I'm out of the lines. I'm like, you're so nice. All of them were so amazing. Oh my goodness. I love what you were talking about how constraint encourages creativity. Mm-hmm. For example, if you walked into a blank gallery of just endless white walls and somebody told you to paint on them, you'd feel overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. But if you're given a tiny little square and you have to paint on that, it that constraint can really force you to get very creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of research behind that. And I do believe in that. So I discovered you through your Musings in Movement community class. Can you explain what that is and what inspired you to create this? Yes, thank you. As you know, I've worn a lot of different hats. One of my passions while I was in the military and when I left the military was fitness. I taught yoga, spinning, slide, step, aquatics, older adults, little kids, choreography, and then I trained proteins as well or semi-proteins. And the idea of combining empowerment and fitness and writing, like to me, they are all fused together and there's something really magical. And in most other activities, you know, people combine care for the body and in writing, we don't. And when I started writing, really seriously writing about 15 years ago, you know, I had my neck injury and I was already doing specific stretches. I can't sit for very long. How I approach things is a little bit different as far as mechanical movements in my body. And so I have to take really good care of myself if I want to stay functional and not in a wheelchair. And so I had my own routines that I had begun doing for my own self-care. 
And a lot of them revolved around stretches that I felt would be great for the writer. And I approach writing like I have approached athletics. It's mm. training, like you develop a habit because you are training yourself to write. You're training your brain and you're training your body and you're training your lens, your eyes and how you see and interpret things. So between the military and being an athlete, I approached writing with that same mindset of this is training. I've done techniques called brain gym. There's a whole thing with, I mean, a whole avenue we could go down and do 15 shows on. That's really cool. So I just wanted to start offering that out to the world. And Gail Brandeis, who does a lot of visceral body work with her writing and how she approaches craft. And she was one of my mentors in grad school. So I sat down with her and said, would you like to do something like this? So it combines movements that you could do in a chair, really comfortable, gentle movements for the writer, along with writing prompts. And we pick a body part. And the cool oh. thing is we don't talk to each other about what we're going to teach. We each bring oh. two exercises and two prompts without communicating what we're going to bring to the table. So it's impromptu for both of us. And then we just go back and forth and share this like last the last one we did was on our feet and the one before that we did our belly. And so we just pick a body part and how you can care for that. But also the writing prompt revolves around that body part too. So like yeah. it, with the feet prompt, it was, what do you stand for? Draw, trace your foot or draw foot in your journal. What do you stand for? What do you care about? Write all that in your journal. What are things that you are against? Put that all on the outside of your foot. Now pick one and write about it. So we do that type of thing. And it's just, it's really fun. It's themed. It's 30 minutes. It's free. It's once a month. And then we offer a PDF of the whole workshop. So if you can't attend the class, you have that um, file and you can go back and just go through it. So I just love the fact that you're calling attention to the fact that we do need to care for our bodies because it is easy to get sucked into the worlds that we're writing. And then, you know, hours pass by and we're like, oh, I forgot to eat, let alone pee. Or drink water or, yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, I feel like really great writing includes the body. There's the visceral response that's happening and that evokes the emotion for the reader. So connecting with your body when you're writing, pausing your writing, I feel like it makes your writing richer. There is a symbiotic relationship that needs to happen and you can't really separate them. So if you're uncomfortable and your body hurts when you're writing, I think it's reflected in your writing. You can't move freely in your writing if you can't move as freely as you could in your body, regardless of whatever yeah. physical limits you might have. Well, it also just reminds me of the manuscript that I edited this past week, a lot of my comments were, and how does this feel in the character's body? Like, I want to see their physical reaction to what is going on around them. And then I would give 20 million examples of what could possibly be happening to just help them to yeah. see what it is that I'm talking about. Because the last thing I want to do to a writer is say, show me, don't tell me and not provide any examples or ask questions. And then they're like, if I knew how to do that, I, I would have done yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. So... What are the three biggest lessons you want writers to walk away from after attending your musings and movement classes? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Only three? You're limiting me to three. Only three. You know, <laughs> you want to throw some more out there? Feel free to throw some more out there. I, I think first of all is just permission to take care of themselves. The world of writing is... I think we're super critical. It's isolating. We're hard on ourselves. We have our editor head. We're trying to turn off. And then we didn't do enough that day. We're strict on word counts, whatever it is that we're pushing and pushing and pushing because it's so important to us as artists and to just love on yourself, just take care yeah. of yourself. And it's been a hard lesson for me to learn because I've had a lot of my own challenges with self-destruction, with anorexia and bulimia for years and years and years. And so learning to just accept my body, accept myself and forgive myself, you know, give myself some permission, like you did good today. This was a good day and you showed up. We can be super hard on ourselves, especially with deadlines and commitments and obligations. Our plates, I think in the world of writing, most writers are teachers. Most of us are doing other things along with writing. You know, we're parenting and other work like this podcast that you're doing. So there's all these extra components. 
and they all infuse the writer's life. But how do you balance that and not forget to take care of yourself? So yeah. for me, like the musings and movement, it's the combination of taking your self-care more seriously, however that yeah. looks for you, and being playful is like bringing the joy back in writing where you're excited, you know, to show up to your work and show up to the page and, you know, remembering why you're an artist to begin with and why this matters to you, what your why is, what your intention is behind your work. So yes. I think those are the two biggest things is caring for yourself and remembering your why and just getting back to being excited, bringing the joy back in the task. Because man, if you live a life where you've taken good care of yourself and you love what you're spending your time doing, that's a pretty darn good life. I love that immensely. When we spoke earlier, you mentioned that you have dealt with a lot of trauma in your life and you use writing as another form of therapy. Can you talk to us about that? Oh my goodness, absolutely. I'm trying to figure myself out through my writing. And I, I teach about this too, about being mindful when you're approaching difficult topics to have a list of things regarding your own care so you don't re-trigger or re-traumatize yourself. But for yeah. me, it's been very important to write about my experiences. It's like giving voice to places I've been silenced. And I think that's very true of a lot of trauma, whether it was self-induced silence, like in the military, where you keep a game face and you don't complain and everything's fine all the time, or outer induced trauma from sexual violence and abuse, right? So it could mm -hmm. be either way. And for me, I, I realized once I created what I dub as a discount, so getting out of that writing. So I usually have a playlist of things I listen to when I'm writing. And if I know I'm working on a piece that's going to go dark or go deep, I have music that I'll play to come out of that mentality. And oh. I'll write. And so it's usually something upbeat. And I was training to be a poetic therapist for a little while. And then I decided to do a couple MFAs back to back instead. But I did most of the training and I read all the material. I did like four years of training and I love it. And I apply it to my, a lot of the teaching that I do. But one of the things that they continuously kept reframing and pushing is, and on a high, if you're in a group and they go deep, you can't leave them in this dark place. Oh, sorry, we're wrapping. We're done with class. So you have to like pull them up and out of that, you know, whether it's the writing prompt, something lighter. And I just always feel like I've got to do that for myself with my writing. Yes. And this was like 10 years ago. And so some of those dismounts are like a candle and it's a certain smell. Music, definitely. I'll go take a walk. I just get out of the space of writing. I'll go stretch. If I feel good, maybe I'll dance to some music and move around, but I'll have a whole list of things that help me get out of that space. So yes, it's therapy, but it's also, I find a way to take care of myself afterwards. And then it is truly therapy because I've addressed something. Like I've gotten it out of my body, like getting that body story out when you've had that experience is cathartic, is healing. And for me, it might not be that way for everyone, but for me, it definitely has been a really great way to understand and find meaning in difficult experiences, find meaning. I think for me, that's the most important thing is can I make meaning out of, not necessarily make sense of it, but find meaning in it. You know, if I can take my trauma and use it to teach these girls in the juvenile system and help them, there's meaning in my experience. It doesn't mean that what happened to me makes sense and it's okay right. now, right? But I find purpose that I can now use that experience and do something good with it. It's the similar thing that pushed me when I first started writing again. I felt like I had been pushed into silence. I have a difficult relationship with my father. We had a massive fallout. I had a breakdown in front of my kids. It was the moment that I realized that my thoughts and opinions didn't matter to him at all. There was nothing I could say that would reach him. And I just felt so utterly 
invisible and silenced. And that's when I finally started writing again. And so a lot wow. of my work was initially creative nonfiction. And the purpose behind that was not only to help myself finally find my voice and be heard, mm -hmm. but also to reach other parents, other people who had been in similar situations and to try to reach and connect with them to help them realize that they weren't alone and to help them find the words for something that maybe they were struggling with that they haven't had a chance to process and vocalize yet. So I just appreciate so much what it is that you're doing because I think it's vital and there's so many people out there who just need that. And let's talk about this as moms. We put a yeah. game face on. It's like I yeah. went right back into the military once I birthed children because you can't show all of your emotions, especially when they're young. It's frightening for them. And so we hold a lot in. And then at the end of the day, there's no space. You're exhausted. There's no space to unpack it. Or you might not have a safe person or even a partner who has the capacity or the bandwidth to help you manage it. So having a place for your voice, if that's the page or it's drawing or dancing or sketching or singing or going out and opening your mouth and arms to the rain, like whatever it is that gives you space to have that, then that's what you can do. And I think writing becomes that thing for so many periods because you can take your journal with you almost anywhere. You can jot just a few notes down and process and there is something about your words finding some permanency and there's something about you can take yeah. that page and burn it if you are afraid, right? There's so much power either way. If you want it to be permanent or you want it to never be read, you have so much power in your words at that point. And I think that's the feeling like it's not your, just your voice back. You've gotten your power back with that. And I'm sure psychologically and scientifically, there's like a bazillion research studies and articles that have been written about this that I've yet to explore. But I know for me, yeah. it works. And if it works, I just don't, I don't mess with it. <laughs> I hear you. I really, really struggled after I had kids, especially my second child. I became an at-home parent all of a sudden. And I had undiagnosed ADHD, undiagnosed anxiety. And it just kept snowballing. And I couldn't put the mask on all the time. It started unraveling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And my kids, unfortunately, saw that. And I carry so much guilt from that. But I think one of the first things that I wrote was that holding on to that guilt tethered me to the past. And it prevented me from being able to move forward. And if I stayed tethered to the past and that guilt, then I wasn't actually helping my kids or my family. Or yourself. Right. And so getting back into writing helped me to process all of that. And I'm happier. And my kids see that I'm happier. My seven year old keeps saying to me, Mama, I can't believe you're going to be an actual author. I'm like, thanks, bud. I love you. Yeah. Thanks, so, thanks for the kudos. You know what? Right. I think I want to segue into that idea that you're talking about with permission as parents. Like, I think there's an age when it's okay for them to see your flawed self. My kids know I'm quirky. We moved into this house in the middle of the only snowstorm here in Idaho in like 30 years. And we had like 17 wow. inches of snow and we're pulling in these U-Hauls and we had to wait for exactly five o'clock before we could open the doors. I had backyard chickens, I had dogs, I had my sons and I was starting grad school and we opened the door and I said, watch mommy throw an adult temper tantrum. And I laid on the floor and I kicked my feet and I pounded the ground. I tried not to throw my neck out and they just all stood there. And then I sat up and I go, I feel better. I'm done. And they're like, okay then. But it, it gives them permission to be flawed. I used to tell them, if I can say, I'm sorry and teach you to accept my apology, I've done a yeah. great service, right? Because I'm flawed. Wow. And so it gives them permission to make mistakes and say they're sorry and do better, right? And yeah. um, so I think as parents, like we want to keep that mask on, but there's a point where I'm like, you get to see me 
my four-year-old had his little temper tantrum tonight as I was putting him to bed. And he called me a watermelon head because apparently that's his thing right now if I'm really angry with you. A watermelon. <laughs> he screamed at me, you're a watermelon head. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry you're having a hard time, bud, but we're still putting your PJs on. <laughs> Actually, what I said, I, I called him a monster. And this is funny, though, because he paused and he's like, oh. I'm not a monster. And I was like, no, really, you are. And I held up his PJs and they were monster PJs. And then he started laughing hysterically. And then when we were cuddling in bed for the night, he was hugging me like I was his stuffy. He said, I love you forever. And I said, even though I'm a watermelon head. And he got really sad for a moment. And he was like, I'm sorry, mama. And I was like, does mama still love you? And he was like, always and I was like that's right it's the greatest gift because otherwise they carry a bunch of guilt over choices that they make when they're feeling emotional or you know yep. other experiences that are going on my now 19 year old he hated me for an entire year like hated me and here's what we did we did a journaling thing he was really having a difficult time and after about three months of him being brutally mean, I bought a journal. I handed it to him and I said, here's what we're going to do. You can ask me anything and you can say anything you want to say to me in this journal. And then you put it in my top drawer of my nightstand and I will answer any question you ask honestly, as honestly as I can. And then mm -hmm. I will put this, where do you want me to put it when I'm done? And we will never talk about what's in this journal unless you want to. Oh. We did that for the rest of the year and we were okay. We're what? super close now. But it was, I'm like, how can I help him manage? And he was going to counseling and stuff, but he was dealing with a lot. But that journal yeah. helped us. Thank you so much for sharing that story. So you once said, my life informs my art and my art informs my life. How so? And in what ways? When I talk to other writers and my writing tribe or my writing community, there's the struggle of, I know I need to write this or I don't know what to write about. People talk about writer's block and the different things, approaching that blank page, you know, as a challenge. And my philosophy, not that it will work for everyone, is go live life as fully as possible. Try to be as present as possible as you can in the little things, the smallest things, and then journal about those little things, whatever those things are. That's your writing. That's what's going to inform everything about your approach to art, how you live your life, the intention behind your choices, how you see the world, how you interact with the world. It informs your art. And then as you write about it, you start processing it a little differently and it does inform who you are and how you behave. I'm a Jew, but I'm a Kabbalist. And one of the ideas behind that is if somebody really bothers you, like something about them really irritates you, it is a mirror. And that yes. thing that is irritating you about them is probably something you don't like about yourself. And something that you find really pleasant about someone is also a mirror. You cannot appreciate what you don't have within you. So the whole world is your mirror. Every experience, every way you interact, you find beauty in this. This bothers you. You're dreading this. Like it's all a reflection of your lens. So it informs your writing. That's how you're going to approach story and vice versa, how you approach life. They just go back and forth. They're interwoven. The process of writing it helps give me that interior insight that you don't see as you're experiencing something. And a lot of our experiences are reactionary based on our mm. previous experiences, based on our history. They're triggering events. And we're like, this person is not that person back there, but I'm responding to them as if they are. Let me process that a little bit so it can inform me. So it just keeps going back and forth like that. Going back to journaling, I had this moment with my seven-year-old back when he was probably five. And he and I got into a horrible, horrible fight. I ran into my room and I started writing furiously in my journal because I was so mad. And it started off with all the things that he did that just drove me up the wall. And then I just naturally started looking at everything that he had dealt with earlier that day 
that nudged him in that direction. And then I realized, oh, well, of course he reacted that way. Poor kid. Like he really needed a break. And you know what? So did I. Right. We both had a really tense day. So I like how writing can inform life in that sense. And then the other comment I wanted to say is that I, as a writer, I value immensely being present in the moment because when I write, I really sink myself into the moment and it feels like meditation where I am focusing on Mm -hmm. all the senses around me. And yet, as a Virgo, as a grown woman with ADHD, I struggle immensely with being present in the moment, even with my own family, because my brain is racing constantly, no matter how many to-do lists I create, it helps to relieve that pressure. But I just always have these things that I feel like I need to be doing. And so it is very hard for me to be in the moment. But the other night, My kids and my husband were playing Uno at the dining room table, which is one of my favorite card games. And somebody made a comment about me and my son, the older one, said, oh, she's working because my desk is in the living room now. Mm -hmm. And I looked up from my computer and I looked at them directly ahead of me and I said, hey, guys, let me know when you're starting the next round. Deal me in. Oh, And sure enough, that game ended like literally two seconds later. And I closed that laptop and I did. I went and I sat down with him and we played three more rounds, two of which I won. But so it's just it's that constant internal struggle where at least I do recognize that this is something that I struggle with. And so I still try to be intentional about it and aware of it so that I can still recognize when it's an issue and try to address it and course correct when I can, like with Uno. There's like three things I want to respond to with what you were saying. I think, first of all, the course correction, most writers are writing from home and trying to balance the boundary of I'm working and trying to focus. I mean, I was working on a golden shovel poem and like super hyper focused on trying to like trickle down the line to the end word. Right. And I kept getting interrupted. And I felt like every time I was interrupted, I had to start again and start again. And I work through interruptions all the time because I work from home. But there's something that I'm learning to do a little bit better that I've been working on for a little while. And that is trusting that the story doesn't leave you. Like you could just write a small note to yourself and come back to that line. And as long as you stay engaged with your work, and I think it was Courtney mom who said, even when you're taking a break from writing, just return to the project you're working on five minutes a day. And, mm-hmm. and then you're not starting from scratch. You don't have to re-engage your brain all the way. So you can just end in a place and know that you're going to launch right back into that place and trusting that so that you can pause and go engage with your family. For me, I'm a single mom. So for me, I used to tell myself, okay, when they came home from school, let me give them all of my undivided attention. They're hungry. They need a snack, homework, mom time. You know, what do we need to do? And then they just wanted me to leave them alone. And then I could work. And that was really powerful for me. And then the other thing you were saying is about how you were writing from your, like you started trailing down the page about all the things that your son went through. And that is a really powerful tool as a writer. I was writing... I mean, this book, Tangled by Blood, is a memoir in verse. And it is me dealing with my mother and her inability to protect me from my stepfather. And for a while, I felt like she was like a caricature on the page. And I didn't want to do that. But I also, you know, I left home when I was 14, made it on my own, joined the military, and I didn't know her as a person. Yeah. So I started journaling the scenes that I was writing about from her perspective or what I thought could be her perspective. And then I was able to show up with a little bit more compassion. And that is super helpful. I think as a writer, I didn't use her perspective. I did in some cases, but I didn't really use her perspective, but it gave me insight just to try to understand the stress, the worry, 
the tools that weren't in place in the 60s and 70s that we have in place as support for, you know, single moms now that she didn't yeah. have back then. And that was really helpful. So getting to that place where you're doing that in your journal with your son, it flips a switch yeah. uh, and you come from a place of compassion. And it's yes. super helpful when you're trying to figure something out. That's therapy. You just saved yourself $150 by journaling and not needing to chat with someone, it, you could do that all on your own between you and the yeah. page. And it's beautiful. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it is definitely one of my favorite methods to get out my worries, my concerns, my frustrations, my raw feelings that are bubbling to the surface mm -hmm. so that I can realize what he was also dealing with. And then I showed him not the journal, but I got a piece of paper and I drew a spiral. And then at the center of the spiral was where he and I exploded with our fight. And then I spiraled outwards and I would draw a flag, the thing that happened right before the fight. Mm -hmm. And I labeled it. Mm -hmm. I spiraled out a little more and I added another flag and something else that happened. And by the time we got to the end of the spiral, there were eight or nine flags that we were heading toward that fight. And when I showed him how many of those we passed without course correcting then, without trying to shift our mood or take a break or whatever, like I was impressed that he made it through eight or nine red flags before he and I finally blew. And he was also really impressed with himself. And he was like, wow, mama, I dealt with a lot today. <laughs> Like, yeah, high tolerance did. threshold. Yeah. <laughs> right? Amazing. Oh. Yeah. And so he and I were just able to realize that we both had a really hard day and that we still loved each other and that we were sorry for fighting with each other and saying things that we didn't mean to say. And the day ended with us both feeling better about ourselves and knowing that we still loved each other. I love that. Yeah. That's how that matters. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> so that brings us to the end of our show. But I always close out with this question. And that is, what are some of your favorite books and some of your kids' favorite books and why? I love so many books for so many reasons. Here's the ones I'm rereading for like the third time. I have a little stack here. The Warrior of Light by Paula Goela. Mm. Come the Slumberless to the Land of Nod by Tracy Brimmel, and I love her. Galway Kennel, The Book of Nightmares, anything by Lee Young Lee, but I'm rereading, I think for the fourth time, The City in Which I Love You. These are poetry because I have been revising poetry. Well, the Paulo Coelho book is not a poetry book, but it's like this advice book, right? The Warrior yeah. of Light, it's a companion book to The Alchemist. If you've ever read The oh, Alchemist. Yeah. I have. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. And actually, I purchased that book at the airport in Italy. And I read the book when I was in Italy in my early 20s with a friend. I would say the Thomas Hardy's Jude the Obscure when I was I don't know. in my 20s was a book that really shaped me as a writer and just all the interior, the complication and tension and relationships, the stakes were so high, beautifully written. And I became obsessed with Thomas Hardy. I went, I visited his home in Dorset because oh. I was stationed there in England for eight years. Literature was such a great experience for me in my military days. And then mm -hmm. I've read and reread and studied All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. And that book is Really, the whole thing is a meditation. It's beautiful. And I'm a slow reader. Like I linger. I don't want to speed through it. I don't want to race yeah. to get it done. I want to sit with it. I want it to last, right? And I try to read contemporary global work. So there's this nice. book called, it's fiction, called Lemon, Quan Yil Sun, and super interesting approach to narrative. And it just was recently translated. So it was like, okay, here's a Korean novelist I would have never had access to. And because we do have more access to literature from other cultures and countries, it can inform us in so many ways, but how we use language and how they use language and the beauty in that. So I try to go broad. 
one of my favorite lit classes ever was my world literature class. And just to realize how narrative can be so different, the thinking process, the interpretation of language, the way words are put together is just mind-blowing. And the words used to describe things, right? You just go, I would have never yeah. thought to say this woman had lemon hair, but wow, that's right? a beautiful description of blonde. And so I love reading work that has been translated because I don't read other languages very well. Have you read the Garlic Ballads? No, Yan? no. Oh, it's it's actually banned in China. Ooh, okay. Yeah, I read it so many years ago. The peasants of Paradise County in China have been living a hard scrabble existence virtually unchanged for hundreds of years until a glut on the garlic market forces them to watch a crop that is their lifeblood wilt, rot, and blacken in the fields, leading them to storm the seat of corrupt communist officialdom in an apocalyptic riot. Against this historic backdrop unfold three intricately interwoven tales of love, loyalty, and retribution between a man and a woman, a father and a child, friends and friends. Wow, that sounds gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote it down. And that is a book that has stayed with me. And like I said, I haven't read it in such a long time, but the image that stays the most with me was a pregnant woman walking and she's having a conversation with her unborn child. And the unborn child is saying, but I want to come out and I want to see the sun. And she's saying, oh, but the sun will scorch you and burn you. Yeah. And, and that was before I was a parent. And I have never forgotten the image of mm -hmm. that conversation mm -hmm. with her child. Yeah. What stays with you and who would think to write of the conversation being reciprocal? That's beautiful. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. And then real quick, any favorite books for your kids? So I was thinking of there's the monster at the end of the book when they were little. And oh, I would read that in, yeah. you know, Grover's voice, which was really fun. Oh. They are all big readers. And my oldest, mm -hmm. who's disabled, is studying with Joe McGee, who's a YA writer, and my oldest is writing his own books. And he's a good storyteller and writer. So he is reading all of Joe McGee's books, kind of studying what Joe does. And I think one of the titles is Peanut Butter and Brains. And then my youngest loves epic work. And he's fascinated with science and sci-fi, and he pens his own graphic novels, which is really interesting. Oh. The, my That's really middle cool. son is reading the classics. He's reading Moby Dick right now. And he's a, he's a third year student in college. And I have all the, what I deem the hundred greatest books ever written in leather bound books. And he started pulling those and buying his own copy, like one a month in a leather bound copy. And I'm like, if I've done nothing else with him outside of the <laughs> year of journaling, when he hated me, I gave him the love of literature. So there's a lot of love of literature, a lot of books in this house. So they love reading. They love telling stories. And, you know, I listen to them. I'm like, that's a great idea. I mean, they're really smart. Again, it informs me as an artist in a different way to not limit my mind or how I might see things because they all have their yeah. own perspective and take on things. So it's really good. Well, thank you for ending that on such an inspiring and encouraging note, because now I have these dreams of, if nothing else, hopefully my kids will pick up on how much we love books, because we read pretty much three books every night before bed with the kids still. That's amazing. Yeah, that's great. And the art of storytelling, you know, it crosses boundaries and cultures and time. It's a gift. Yeah, definitely. Well, Thank you again for joining me on the show. All of your contact information is in the show notes description, but is there one last thing that you would like to say before we go? I think just read, love on yourself, write your heart, and do something good with your experiences, whatever they are, whatever happened mm -hmm. to you, use them as fuel to make a difference. That is beautiful. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. This is amazing what you're doing and I love it. I'm so honored to be part of it. So thank you very much for the space. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You take care and uh, stay in touch. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) We'll have to keep trading book recommendations. So I love that. I'm going to look up the thyroid balance. Love it. Mm -hmm. 